Okay, so where we left off on Friday, we were breaking up the skeleton into its two components, the axial skeleton and then the epithelial skeleton. Um, the axial skeleton has 25 bones in the skull, and then um, cervical breast, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx, making up the vertebral column. We also have bones of the rib, bones of the rib cage, I guess I should say. There are 24 bones here. And really, there's a right side and a left side. So you have the left pair and you have a right pair. And then the last bone is going to be right in the middle is the breastbone, or more accurately, the sternum. So those are all the bones now that make up this thing called the axial skeleton, which is that green area shown on this figure, kind of the center or the axis, axle of the body. The other portion of the skeleton is the appendicular skeleton. And when you look at the appendicular skeleton shown here in purple, what you should see is the right side and the left side. So if you learn just one side, you just need to learn all the bones, then you know the right side, or you know the left side, just based off of one side. left and the right sides, and between the two they are symmetrical. Remember we have two different girdles. We have the pectoral girdle and then we also have the pelvic girdle. Pectoral girdle is on top and so you have uh, making up the actual girdle, what attaches the limbs to the skeleton are the clavicle, which is here in the front, and then on the back is the scapula. And then attached to those bones are the bones of the arm or the bones of the limb, which are going to be the humerus. radial bone, the ulna, and then all of the bones in the hands. Just real quick, in the hands, the wrist, those are carpals. In the palm, they're metacarpals, and then in the fingers or the digits, those are called phalanges. Now, you're also going to see phalanges in the foot just here in just a second. Um, so really, to differentiate between hand and foot, you would have to say the first distal phalange of the hand as opposed to the first distal phalange of the hand. The pelvic girdle is what attaches the lower limbs to the skeleton. There are actually three bones in the pelvis. Ilium, ischium, and cubus bones, but they're all fused together, so you end up really with just two sides. An individual side of the pelvis is called the coaxial bone, and really it's three separate bones that have been fused together. Uh, and then they are, the, the pelvis, are, each coaxial articulates on each other in a joint called the pubic symphysis, and then onto the sacral bones of the vertebral column. So the pelvis is what actually is going to attach the big bone in the leg called the femur, and then the two smaller bones, the lower limb, which are the fibula and the tibia. By the way, the tibia is the bigger of the two, the larger of the two, the fibula is the smaller of the two. The kneecap, which is the patella, And 
finally into the bones of the foot. In the foot, which have very similar structure here to the hands, you have the wrist and the ankle being synonymous, and then the palm and the sole of the foot being synonymous, and then the toes and the fingers being synonymous. Uh, the bones of the ankle are called the tarsal bones, and they touch the tibia. And then the bones of the sole are the metatarsals. We have metacarpals up here in the hand, and then again, all of our phalanges make the toes. So those are all the bones and how they would be organized anatomically or what we would call in the skeleton. I'm going to really shift gears here now, and I want to begin to take a look at how a bone develops. So in one sense, you can pick up from where we had left off when we were talking about generating those embryonic tissues. So remember that the, based off of the unique environmental exposure and the cell's physical history, it's going to begin to be faded towards a specific tissue type. One of the tissue types that is going to begin to arise from um, a, a primordial tissue called the mesenchyme is going to be bone tissue. And it takes a, um, an initial model of cartilage that then goes through this process of being calcified to form a bone. I'm going to have two pictures here for you, and we're going to take you kind of through a snapshot uh, along the way. And each snapshot has a uh, sort of a uh, important feature or important physiological occurrence that is, that is happening. So bone development actually really begins begins shortly after the one cell one cell stage so this is that time point shortly after conception we're going to begin to have bone tissue that begins to develop and so much so that you actually on an ultrasound can begin to see the basic bone model skeleton of the individual pretty early on now this bone development begins in multiple areas. In fact, it's roughly about 300 different areas throughout the organism as we develop these 300 different bones that eventually become the 206 that we have in adults. And these are areas that are exemplified by numbers of dividing cells. Again, how do we get unique tissue? We get unique tissue through unique environmental conditions. So within these dividing cells, we're beginning to have these cells exposed to unique environmental conditions. And these unique environmental conditions begin to activate and deactivate a unique volume of proteins. And so we have this unique mix of proteins that are beginning to accumulate in these areas of dividing cells. And one of the um, tissues that begins to, the first noticeable tissue that begins to rise uh, out of these primordial embryonic tissues is a tissue that's called hyaline cartilage. So hyaline cartilage. And that's what you can see occurring here. And the hyaline cartilage begins to develop and it gives a basic structure or a basic model of what that bone should look like in the future. So this hyaline cartilage is a model of the basic bone shape. Now, the hyaline cartilage is a tissue. Tissues are made up of cells. And in this particular tissue, the cells that 
that are present to produce the cartilage are called chondroblasts. In other words, the unique environmental conditions have differentiated primordial embryonic cells now into a unique cell called the chondroblast that's generating and maintaining this hyaline cartilage forming the basic bone model. And this is happening all over. All over in now what would be called the fetus. That's supposed to be up here, there not the multiple areas of the fetus. And so we're looking right around two months, approximately two months after conception. We transitioned out of the embryonic phase and we're now into the fetal stage, which is going to take us through all the way to birth. And so now we're beginning to get unique tissues in addition to these highline models that begin to form. The next step here is to take that highline, uh, highline cartilage model and begin to solidify it. So we want to begin to make it more like a bone. And initially it starts out and we have one region of that highline model that begins to be ossified, which simply means we're mineralizing, putting down the right type of material to produce a bone. And we form a shell first. So a shell forms around this bone model. And it happens in a specific location first, called the primary ossification center. The material or the shell that's being put down here at the primary ossification center, the tissue is called periosteum. This periosteum is actually going to persist into adulthood. It's the same material or the same tissue that you actually have covering all of your bones right now. So this outer layer of tissue, the periosteum, it's an outer group of cells, and we begin to form that shell first. So you kind of have to imagine in your mind that we have this shell of periosteum, and then you still have the hyaline cartilage on the inside. Shortly after this begins to happen, and you can see there's still trying to hear a picture too, you can begin to see that the center here around that primary ossification center, where that shell has just formed, they call it a bone collar here, that bone collar is forming and we begin to lose some of that hyaline tissue. So it begins to transition away from the hyaline. So that hyaline model begins to degrade. So we undergo degradation. As we begin to have that degradation occur, this opens up space in that bone model. And once we get that space to open up, we have this, uh, in, this uh, uh, invasion of blood vessels. So we begin to bring in blood supply. Something unique is going to happen here as that blood supply enters into the bone. So we're just simply going to say the bone model is vasculated. That just simply means that those vessels are coming in. So as the blood vessels develop, we begin to have blood flow. And as that blood flow begins to move through this bone model, and again, remember, this is happening in various places throughout the fetus. We have multiple locations where the bone is undergoing its development. So with the blood vessels brings blood. So blood begins to be delivered into this highline model. And the thing about blood, I said there was something that unique happens. With that blood, we now have a whole new host of proteins and a whole new host of cells that are beginning to interact here with this hyaline model.
In particular, one of the cell types that shows up on the scene as we go through this bone development process is a cell called the osteoblast. So we have osteoblasts that arise. Now there are three types of cells that I'm going to, I'm going to kind of give you a primer on. We're going to come back and talk about this a little bit more. Uh, there are the osteoblast, the osteoclast, and the osteocyte. In order to remember those three types of bone, the osteoblast with a B is our bone builder. So the osteoblast is going to come in and it's going to build bone. So now that I have osteoblast coming in, we actually can enhance our bone building capabilities for each of these bone models. The osteoclast is a bone destroyer and it will rip apart bone. It will actually begin to degrade bone. The osteocyte is the cell that maintains the bone. It's classically the bone cell osteocyte. So osteoblasts, bone building cells. So this is really where we're going to begin to take off with the uh, bone building process. As those osteoblasts arrive on the scene, they begin to generate changes in the environment. Now at this point, hopefully you're all really primed that whenever you have a change in the environment that the cells are exposed to, you begin to have a shift in the tissue and the physiology. The osteoblasts go about changing the environment by pumping up this mixture of stuff. And that mixture is going to be called osteoid. Again, let me make sure I spell it right. Okay, so this mixture is osteoid. And really what osteoid is, is it's a solution that contains enzymes, which are just simply proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. So we have a whole new host of chemical reactions that can be uh, catalyzed, or that means that those reactions will begin to go. And then we release a protein called collagen. And collagen is a very fibrous protein, and this is basically going to begin to uh, set down on the bone. It's going to begin to create a lattice for me. And that should sound very familiar. It should sound like spongy tissue, which is one of those two composite materials for bone. So we now have new chemical reactions that can occur, and we're beginning to build this lattice work that's going to allow us to begin to create this overall adult bone structure. So the collagen begin to build a matrix of that softer tissue called spongy tissue. So continuation here of those first three images that you saw, uh, you can see that now we have a very well-defined center here, vasculated. You can still see the periosteum on the outside and then that collagen containing spongy tissue in the middle. Okay. This process of building the soft matrix continues into childhood. Now, we are very fortunate for the design that God's given us here, right? Because think about it. Kid, little kids, they fall down when they're trying to first start to, uh, trying to start to walk. They're being bumped around and it seems like they'd be hurt all the time. You watch a little kid and you're like, man, I feel like I break my leg. How come he didn't just break his leg? And it's because we're still in the middle of this development process. So the tissue here, it's not as strong as your tissue, your bones, but it's far more flexible. And so they can take that impact and they can deal with it a lot better than us. It's a really good design because we're going to be going through that developmental process, learning how to walk, running into everything that 
is off to kill you, and you survive somehow. So it continues into childhood, and really what happens after we've got this really nice uh, soft matrix that's been created, we begin to harden that matrix, right? We want to now add in the second material in our composite. So minerals, minerals, minerals begin to deposit. That was an abbreviation. Minerals, minerals. Minerals deposit. No, minerals begin to deposit. And this process of putting down these minerals, which are going to be calcium and phosphate, we've already discussed that. This is known as ossification. So we're beginning to produce the uh, material that's going to harden the bone through ossification. The calcium and the phosphate come together in one package called hydroxypapatite. So hydroxypapatite, again, made up of calcium. That uh, solution that was being generated by our osteoblast is called osteoid. Osteoid production begins to reduce at this time. And remember, why were we generating osteoid? Well, because it had the enzymes for some unique chemical reactions, but we also had the collagen. So the collagen was being laid down, which was essential to begin to build that. That, that structure that we're now part of. So we don't want to continue to build that soft structure. We've created that, and we now want to lay down our, our calcium phosphate so that it gets the heart. So osteoid production is reduced. And now that we're no longer producing that large amount of collagen, the softer tissue, things are beginning to get hard. Those osteoblasts that entered in initially, they're now going to begin to be trapped as the tissue gets harder and harder. So the osteoblasts get trapped in the bone. Now, this is a change in environment. So what should I expect of these cells? The cells are now in a different environment. They should change themselves in response to that environmental change. So the osteoblasts, once they get trapped in the bone, they differentiate. They change into a new type of cell. And we'll refer to that as the maturation of the osteoblast. So as the osteoblast matures, it turns into an osteocyte. And I just mentioned that osteocyte is the cell that's going to maintain bone. So we've now hardened the tissue enough to change the environment to cause differentiation of an osteoblast to an osteocyte. And with that switch from the two cell types, we switch our physiology. So we switch to maintenance now rather than production. So now we're beginning to maintain the bone. So instead of laying down the collagen, we're making sure that the hardness of that tissue is, is optimal for that particular bone. Back referencing our picture over here, um, we're now basically transitioning over here. And we've gone through sort of these two areas or really three, one on uh, in the middle and then the top and the bottom, where ossification has occurred. We now have osteocytes that are present. Collagen's been laid down, tissue's been hardened. There are two locations, though, one here and one there, that are going to remain relatively active.
In other words, that tissue is not going to just simply be entirely hardened osteoid tissue. We remain, uh, or we keep, I should say, a concentration of osteoblasts. And those osteoblasts that are present continue to produce and pump out osteoid. And now remember, anytime you see osteoid, think collagen. Collagen is being produced. So these two areas were still generating collagen. The next step is to take that collagen and to begin to mineralize, ossify. But as more and more collagen is produced, see what happens here? The collagen is going to push that bone out, and we're going to have elongation or growth of that bone. So we produce the collagen here in these two locations, in these two locations, followed up by ossification. And as the bone is ossified, it pushes out. Pushes outward from the bone ends. And so the whole bone is elongating. So those areas where this is happening, Called the growth points. So the growth continues at those two locations, allowing the bone to elongate. Now, this whole process is going to be making, we want to, because everything else in that bone has basically been reprogrammed to primarily become static, except for these two locations. And the way that we can keep these two locations active is we can maintain them through hormones. And when I say hormones, these are just simply chemicals that are being produced that stimulate the bone to grow. So we have uh, simulated bone growth in those two locations called the growth plates. There are three chemicals in particular, three hormones that are actively involved in this. One of, it, one of those chemicals is growth hormone. The other two are the sex steroids. One is testosterone, and then the other is the other is estrogen. I'm sorry. Yeah, these are stimulating the growth. So these are the hormones or the chemicals that are being released. Growth hormone, testosterone, and estrogen. I didn't really spell testosterone quite right there. Wow. <laughs> Growth hormone, testosterone, and estrogen. So we can begin to lift these signals or change these signals, and that will result in these growth plates beginning to become less and less active. That's a process called fusing. So we can begin to fuse the growth plates, and that's going to result in a reduction or a cessation of growth. So growth begins to stop, lift those hormone signals, and the growth plates fuse. Once those growth plates are fused, we have no new bone that's going to be produced to cause growth. That doesn't mean that the bone totally goes stagnant or silent. We actually continue to have heavy activity in our bones throughout the entire, our entire life where that bone is continually being 
uh, broken down and repaired and broken down and repaired. Uh, it's, remember, one of our um, depots for calcium in particular. So we constantly are taking calcium out and putting calcium back in. Yeah. But at this point, no new bone is being produced. We're just modifying and maintaining the existing bone now here from this point forward to the rest of the individual's lives. This process of stopping or fusing the growth plates, um, for most of you ladies in here, I apologize, but you're probably all done growing. That typically happens right around 18 years. But for the guys, some of you, you may actually get a few more years of growth. The average for males is about 21 years of age. Yes, yeah, so I'm 19, maybe I'll get another age or two. Or you're done. So I said that even though the, the growth plates had fused, out here, especially at the periphery, that tissue again was called the osteum, that remains really active. And we're constantly removing and putting that in minerals. So activity at the periosteum continues. And what this does is it causes the bones to become wider. So the bones will, will widen. And this, this is actually important, right? Because even at 18 and 21, chances are you're actually still going to get a little bit bigger. Even though your bones may not be getting longer, most people grow a little bit wider throughout their college. And it's actually not that you're just going to get totally huge and fat, but just a natural process. But you could, I guess, is what we're the conversation we're having tonight. So for some of you, your bones are going to get really wide because you're just going to blow up like a balloon. <laughs> But it's good because we want to be able to accommodate that additional mass that's going to come, additional muscle mass is still going to develop. Maybe your brain will get bigger, probably not though. And this can continue well into adulthood. This process of widening the bones to help support the additional mass that is actually going to develop. We're also going to have this process continue if we ever have injury to the bone, such as a broken bone, or if we change the application of force. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that at some point. Maybe not today. Um, or I guess we're just going to start that today, but I don't know that we'll get all the way through that. But if you apply force differently, say you change your shoes, and now you have a different type of shoe, or a shoe with more support, changes the forces on the bone that you want to accommodate the, that force rather than allow that force to, to subject you to a higher rate of injury and, and breakdown. So after the bone develops during adulthood, continuing throughout life, you have two processes that can occur. One of them that routinely occurs, which is called remodeling. The other one that occasionally occurs is called repair. So remodeling is that general response to the everyday wear and tear on the bone. Repair is the response that happens if it's broken, or you have some other type of bone injury. Of all the tissues, I think we look at the skeletal muscle, or the skeletal tissue rather, and the bones as just sort of being no, they just hold me up and keep me up. The bones are dynamic throughout your entire life. Because we need to be able to respond. So what you're looking at here, it's kind of a, a strange picture, so let me give you a little orientation before I begin to go through this process. This is showing what's called 
bone remodeling. So if I have a lot of force that's applied on the outside of my leg, let's say, for example, I want to make sure that I have enough tissue, bone tissue on that side to support the application of that force. I don't need as much bone on the inside of my leg where the forces are less. So I can transition bone from one side of the, of the, of the leg bone to the other side to accommodate the two forces. And that's a process that's known as bone remodeling. The process basically starts off when you have application of new force, you reduce bone or you reabsorb bone on one side of the, uh, uh, of the organ called a bone, and you form bone where you need it, where the forces are greater. Okay, so that's really what this process is showing. We're going to take it from one place, put it in another place to recreate that bone or to give you new bone to uh, uh, accommodate those new forces. And this is way over exaggerated for example. It's not like you have a bone and just carve out one huge side of it, put a big bone on the other side. We're talking about very, very small changes but big differences in the support and the ability for the bone to accommodate new force. Okay, so I already gave you a little primer. I said osteoclasts for bones that bone cells that do what? They destroy or break down bone. So the osteoclast is the bone breaker down. That's not really a word, but it sounds pretty awesome. And really what it's breaking down is not the bone. It's just not eliminating the bone. It's actually reducing the concentration of that calcium phosphate hydroxyapatite in certain areas within the bone. So we're going to actually just begin to reduce hydroxyapatite concentration. And we're not just completely tearing that bone completely apart. This liberates or frees the calcium and the phosphate. Calcium and phosphate, when it's liberated by osteoclast, it enters the bloodstream and begins to circulate everywhere. And this is happening constantly. Because uh, calcium is not only used here in the bone for structure, but it's also used in the muscle and in the nerves to help the muscle cell the muscle contract. There was a classic experiment done in the 1800s where a guy, um, he cannulated the dog, this poor dog, right? It means he put uh, needles into the veins, uh, the vessels of this dog, and circulated blood through a device that extracted calcium from the blood. So he basically had a system where he could remove calcium and capture calcium from this dog. And he would let it run for hours and hours and hours. And he would get massive amounts of calcium. And the dog was seeing the dog effect. Now, eventually, you would remove so much calcium that the bone no longer had that structural integrity and it would make it break very easily. But he was able to remove kilograms of calcium from this dog. And the dog really had no, no adverse effect because we have massive amounts of calcium stored inside of our bone tissue. So when we break down the hydroxyapatite, those osteoclasts, liberate or release or free, however you want to say it, the calcium and the phosphate. liberate those the calcium and the phosphate into the bloodstream and it begins to circulate throughout the entire circulatory system. So that means absolutely everywhere, right? Circulating calcium and phosphate everywhere. So we have an increase in the blood levels of both the calcium and the phosphate and a decrease in the bone levels of the two minerals. Now, as that 
uh, calcium and, and phosphate are liberated from the bone, the bone begins to reduce its concentration. If we have application of force on another aspect of that bone and we need additional support, we begin to have changes that occur. And in that bone, areas that require new bone, they attract the activity of osteoblasts. And what do osteoblasts do? Yeah, they're my bone builders. Now, Osteoblasts produce chemical. I don't remember the name of that chemical. Osteoid. And it produces collagen. So we're laying down some new osteoid. We have new collagen that gets laid down. That sets that matrix, that lattice work again. And now we have a, a conduit so that we can begin to cover up. That, uh, that new osteo with some new hydroxy sites. So new hydroxy appetite is deposited. It's a terrible one spot down because that hydroxy appetite is there. Let me get that right. There's like 14 different ways to spell that word. So this new hydroxy appetite is going to be uh, laid down, and this is going to increase the bone tissue in that area. So the net result, you have some changes in the bone's appearance. have a thicker appearance where we're trying to accommodate market forces, a thinner appearance where we're trying to adjust those, adjust to the button, lower forces. So that's the basic process, and I've already alluded to this, but what would be the reason to do this? And the primary reason for remodeling is force. Does everybody have everything they need here? So the primary reason to remodel a bone is because we have application of new forces. And I'm going to give you an example to try to highlight this. So reason to remodel is going to be force. We're going to work through a brief example here. <laughs> okay, so let's say that uh, you're an individual as you walk around, you walk primarily on the inside of your foot. You've been doing this for your whole life. And it's actually not really the best way to walk. It's better to walk on the middle of the foot, right? So you walk on the inside of your foot, and every time your foot plants, you get a large amount of force that's applied to the inner aspect of your leg. You're going to want additional bone on the inner, inner aspect of the femur and the, and the uh, tibia to accommodate those forces that are being applied. So sort of as a response here, the inner aspect of bones like the tibia experience that larger amount of force 
compared to the outer aspect of the tibia that experience a lower amount of force. Not no force, but just a lower amount relative to the inside of the leg. So you go and you begin to have some problems, with, especially places like your hip. And your doctor says, well, let's get you in a narcotic or some sort of way to correct your walking to reduce those forces that are being applied to the hip to see if we can reduce that discomfort. And so it gives you those orthotics, which basically turns parachute into new parachutes. And what happens is it rotates the foot. And so now, every time your foot lands, it actually lands in the middle of the foot rather than on the inside edge. So we rotate the foot with these new shoes or the new orthotics or whatever it is. And you walk now on the midline of the foot rather than the outside of the foot. No, I'm sorry, the inside. And this changes the forces on both the inside and outside of the leg. Just ignore that. I swear that was supposed to say force. So the forces that are being applied to the inside of the leg and the outside of the leg, they're now more equal. So more equal inside and outside, whereas before we had higher force on the inside, lower force on the outside. So if we think about it relative, now that we've equalized the forces, we have reduced force on the inside, increased force on the outside. I want to move bone from the inside to the outside to accommodate the new application of forces. So enter this idea of bone or model. So relative, we have to decrease in force. On the inner aspect, increase in force on the outer aspect. And the result of need is for more support on the outside, less support or a decrease in support on the inside. I leave you with a clinic. What's going to happen? <laughs> you already really know, but we'll talk about that on Wednesday. Pick up what's happening in the Oscar class and the Oscar last to accommodate these new forces. All right, have a nice afternoon or a nice morning.